In the gospel reading for today, Jesus addresses the question of whether or not human suffering is a punishment for sin. It's a question that has been wrestled with since the beginning of time, asked in a wide variety of ways, out of a wide variety of contexts. Three examples. After a diagnosis of stage four cancer at the age of 35, Duke University professor Kate Bowler wrote a book. The title, Everything Happens for a Reason, and other lies I have loved. <laughs> it's been called a meditation on sense making when there is no sense to be made. Buller writes, most everyone I meet wants me to know without a doubt that there is a hidden logic to this chaos. It seemed that everyone was trying to answer for her the same question asked by the disciples when they met a man born blind. Rabbi, they asked, who sinned, this man or his parents? Or, to put it another way, they wanted to know who was to blame? Whose fault was this? What did he do to deserve this? Bowler's experience drove her to ask, does everything actually happen for a reason? The Old Testament book of Job opens with a prologue, and in it, the faithfulness of Job is established, making it clear that he was a good person. It reads like this. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. He was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Before the end of the second chapter, through a series of catastrophic events, Job loses everything, his livestock, his children, his home, his health. Three of his friends come to comfort him, and for 34 chapters, 34 chapters, they take turns floating theory after theory as to why he has suffered so. They are after an explanation. They're after a why as regards his suffering. And the third, on Wednesday, August 19th, 2009, five tornadoes formed in and around the Twin Cities. One of them damaged the church steeple at Central Lutheran in downtown Minneapolis, where the ELCA's churchwide assembly was meeting. You may recall, that immediately after this happened, a local pastor from another denomination offered an explanation for the tornado, claiming in a blog post, and now I quote, that the tornado in Minneapolis was a gentle but firm warning from God to the ELCA and to all of us, turn from the approval of sin. I'm reminded of this story in particular because that pastor justified his speculation about that damaged steeple by referencing the gospel that's before us today. In the blog post, that pastor wrote, and again I quote, in the story from Luke 13, when asked about a seemingly random calamity near Jerusalem where 18 people were killed, I have to stop there. Yes, he wrote, seemingly random, implying that that calamity was not random at all, but rather it was an act of God. So let me start again. When asked about a seemingly random calamity near Jerusalem where 18 people were killed, Jesus answered in general terms, an answer that would cover the calamity in Minneapolis. Those are his words, not mine. And then he concluded, God's message is repent, because none of us will otherwise escape God's judgment, end quote. And that, I tell you, is a disturbingly false reading of the gospel and a misinterpretation of what repentance is about. In no way 
Does Jesus suggest that human suffering is a punishment for sin? In no way did Jesus affirm that the bad things that happened to the people in this story happened because they were, in fact, bad people. And in no way does Jesus accept the assumption that those who suffer somehow deserve it. In fact, in this passage, Jesus actually calls out people for precisely that kind of thinking. It happened like this. Having been given a report by some in the crowd about the death of some Galileans at the hand of Pontius Pilate, Jesus responded sharply by saying, do you think they suffered because they were worse sinners than others? And then he answers his own question, no, I tell you, no making it perfectly clear that their suffering was not a punishment for sin. And then he concludes, unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Now, if you stop reading right here, maybe, but only maybe, you could make a case for suffering as a punishment for sin. Jesus' response might sound something like a warning. If you repent, then you will not perish as they did. In other words, if you repent, then you will be spared. If you are good and faithful and righteous and blameless and upright, then you will be spared. And conversely, if you don't repent, then you will suffer. The problem with that interpretation is that the story in Luke 13 doesn't end there. Jesus keeps talking, expanding on this misguided notion that everything must happen for a reason. He tells the parable of the fig tree. The parable goes like this. A man is frustrated with a fig tree in his vineyard because it has produced no fruit. For three years, it has not blossomed, so he decides to cut it down, and he tells the gardener to do so. But the gardener intercedes and asks for one more year, one more year of nurture, one more year to cultivate, one more year of careful attention, one more year of work in and around the fig tree that it may produce and bear fruit. On the part of the gardener, this is a beautiful gesture of both grace and hope, an act of benevolence bestowed on the undeserving in the hope that it would do what it was made to do, that is, bear fruit. The truth of this passage from Luke hinges on the surprising and important connection that Jesus makes between the call to repentance and the parable of the fig tree. Repentance, you must understand, is not a trade we make with God. It's not an if-then clause. It's not a transaction, quid pro quo. So when Jesus says, unless you repent, he is not setting up a contractual relationship. Hear this. Luke 13 is not a lesson on how to explain or escape suffering. Rather, when Jesus says, unless you repent, he's talking about a change of mind, a change of heart, a transformation. He's talking about the difference between bearing fruit and producing nothing. He's talking about, in the face of human suffering, a turning away from the mind that seeks to explain the unexplainable and a turning toward the heart that breaks open with tears. The poet Mary Oliver writes these words in The Summer Day. Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Her question gets at the heart of this passage. It gets at the heart of Jesus' call to repentance. 
It's a call to engage that one wild and precious life that has so graciously been entrusted to us. It's the call to become who we have been made to be, that is, not judges of one another, but compassionate companions. It's the call for us to bear fruit. One more year, the gardener asked the owner. One more year. And just like the fig tree today, we too have been given yet another opportunity to turn from that which separates us from God and from one another and to turn toward compassion and empathy. So in conclusion, when you encounter the chaos of suffering in others, may your first instinct and gesture be to respond with an open heart and to carry their burden without judgment, without sense-making, without empty platitudes about how everything happens for a reason. And when you encounter the chaos of suffering in your own life, May you be comforted by the truth that everything happens, just not for a reason. And may you be strengthened and buoyed by those who come alongside you, loving you along the way. In Jesus' name, amen.